welcome everyone. This is the Food Fish Markets Identifying and Approaching Buyers. Uh, I'm going to start out with just a little bit of uh, introduction and housekeeping for myself. So my name is Matthew Smith. I'm with Ohio State University. I'm in the College of Food, Ag, Environmental Sciences, and I'm the Extension Aquaculture Specialist. Uh, we had quite a few folks uh, registered for today because I think marketing is a, a massive thing uh, all the time, but especially with the impacts that COVID have ha has had on our aquaculture and aquaponic industry. So we appreciate uh, Amy, Kwamina, Jenny, Ivory, and, and the group uh, willing to come and share some of their experience and their knowledge with us. For the attendees, you will be, uh, you will not have the option to turn on your uh, video and you will all be muted. So please go down uh, to the question and answer part of uh, the chat. So if it's at the very bottom of the Zoom link, put your questions there. If folks, um, if uh, panelists uh, or presenters have time at the end of their presentation, you can uh, have time for a question and answer then. If not, there is a panelist discussion at the end of this. Again, this is gonna just run from 10 to 12 uh, Eastern time today. And uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead, Amy, you should be able to go ahead and share your screen. I'm gonna mute myself and then I will turn my video back on with about two or three minutes uh, left. Uh, but for our first presentation, uh, we have a Amy Schombach with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, and she's going to talk about some web, uh, websites that have uh, that are newly created and probably some additional information to help folks market their products. Thanks so much, Amy, for being here. How about that? Looks great. Go right ahead. Um, I wanted to thank Matt and the Ohio Aquaculture Association for giving me the opportunity to talk about two websites that are available for producers to advertise their farms and their products on. So the two websites I'm gonna share with you today are the Eat Midwest Fish website and the Great Lakes Fresh Fish Finder. I'm gonna break the talk into two parts. So we'll talk about Eat Midwest Fish first, then we'll talk about the Great Lakes Fresh Fish Finder, and then we'll kind of review them side by side and hopefully we can clear the water a little bit because I know that it's been a little bit muddy and there's been a bit confusion that there's two maps um, being launched relatively soon together. As I talk about each, I also wanna share with you guys the funding sources and that'll help you understand on why the websites are focusing on different things. Eat Midwest Fish is a part of a NICRAC project. So that's funded through the USDA and Sea Grant. And that project is looking at um, marketing programming and programming needs um, and consumer education for the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center focused on food fish. So Eat Midwest Fish focuses on food fish because that funded project focuses on food fish and our territory is the 12 states in the North Central region. That website is an online resource hub. It can be found at eatmidwestfish.org. It was launched on January 14th of this year. And the audience for that is the general consumer. It strongly looks at consumer education. So there is stagnant content on there under the umbrella of, um, excuse me, aquaculture literacy. So talking about what aquaculture is, sustainable aquaculture, the benefits of purchasing local fish within your communities. It also touches on nutrition and safety, food preparation, and then also helps to try and connect consumers and producers so they can help find where to find locally produced fish and shellfish. So I wanted to back up just one minute before I highlight different things in the website that I think might be of interest to you, both as a tool or a way to partner, is that another part of the project, we interviewed producers across the North Central region, and we did a total of 27 interviews. And when we asked the question, what are the main hurdles you faced when marketing your products? 41% of the producers mentioned something that was related to consumer education. So some aspect of aquaculture or aquaculture products, um, some of the things that were mentioned were um, people not understanding our products, um, people not understanding that our products are safe, um, people mentioned quality and how quality affects cost and the need to educate consumers on why some of our products cost more. 
um, and touching on other things like food safety um, and how to prepare and that consumers didn't know how to prepare food. So when we were leaving that interview, we also asked if there was anything else people would like to tell us about marketing aquaculture products. And this topic came up a second time and 11% of the producers mentioned the need for consumer education. And so some of the components of the website are really focused on that consumer education and how we can collectively tell the story of aquaculture and our aquaculture products throughout the region. So I'm gonna go through and highlight four different things that I think you might be interested in. The first is the fish guide and that's under local fish. So it is kind of a visual representation of all the species of fish or most of the species of fish that are raised in the North Central region. And so that has an illustration along with the common name and the genus. But as a user scrolls down that list, they also have a few that have this button that says fact sheet. So we're going to expand the content on this by building fact sheets that are available in a digital form, but also a print download. So as educators um, and farmers who are working on educating their public and telling the story of aquaculture, um, you'll have access to a fact sheet that is species specific that talks about what kind of fish it is, where it comes from in the market, some common places to find it, a few uh, qualities about how it's healthy to eat, touches on food safety, and then if they go ahead and flip it over, they'll also have access to a recipe and cooking tips. So tapping into that need to educate consumers about how to, pre to prepare our products. So one reason why I wanted to mention this is we're going to build six of them, launch them, and kind of see if they're a valuable tool for us as a community. And then we'll build more if we find that there's something that is helpful. We have built three already. We have two that are available online, one for walleye and one for yellow perch. Uh, the other in being developed is in tilapia. We have not um, determined what the next three species are. So if you are a farmer or an educator who would want one of these developed on your species to help tell your story, whether it's at your farmer's market table um, or just in a community outreach event, let me know and we can take that into consideration for one of the next um, farm fish fact sheets that we build. The second thing that I wanted to point out is under local fish, there's also an area for local farmer, local fish video series. This is a way that we can use video to tell our regional story. And we do that by selecting one species and partnering with a farmer or multiple farmers um, to talk about that species. So we have one finished, it's on um, shrimp. We have one in development on rainbow trout that are raised in a recirculating aquaculture system. We've identified our third and fourth farmers who are gonna be talking about tilapia in an aquaponic system. And number four is a big question mark. So um, if this is something you're interested in partnering with us to, to tell your story um, and tell the story of regional aquaculture, you can reach out to me um, and let me know that you would be interested. So the third thing that I wanted to point out is um, that there are also recipes that are showing the diversity of our products in the region and also um, education on how to cook those at home for people that are a little timid and need some confidence building. One of the reasons why um, I'm pointing out recipes and demos is because this is an area where there's a need for consumer education. And so recently, Dr. Valle de Souza gave a webinar talk on changes in choice of seafood emerging markets. And she shared that when they asked 1400 people across the United States why they did not prepare seafood at home in 2019, and this was pre-COVID, the number one answer at more than 40% of the respondents said that they did not cook it because I am uncertain of how to prepare it. And another thing that came up that I thought was really interesting to share was that when they looked at attributes on what was really important for consumers when they were buying seafood was is that their seafood was safe, 
their seafood was healthy, and their seafood was fresh. So as we build content on this website, we'll be focusing on what the consumer preference is and what the need for education is. The fourth thing I wanted, and final thing I wanted to point out about this website um, is the fresh fish finder map. So my number one question that I get, and I get texts on the weekends and calls at home is where can I find locally produced fish? So there was a definite need to help connect consumers and producers when it comes to local products. So the, when a user goes to the map, they'll have the option to put their zip code in, and then they'll also have the option to put in a radius. And that will only display the, the farms or farm businesses that are in the region that they're looking. So it kind of customizes it to it. So as a, user, as a user takes their cursor and puts it over one of those pins, what's gonna pop up is a window that displays your business name and your contact location, which will also include a website. For users that don't have websites, or excuse me, for businesses that don't have websites, but have Facebooks where they would like to put that link in, you can also do that there. And so that's really general information and it can be customized to how you want it displayed. So if you don't want your name on there, it doesn't have to appear. If you don't want your exact farm location, that also doesn't have to appear. So it is customizable. Now, in addition to that general information, so this is more like a directory. So this is where I find what farms are there and how to reach them. But if you scroll down that page, there's gonna be additional information for each farm business, which will include that general information, but then we'll also have a product description. And so that product description is where you can kind of tell your story a little bit. You'll have the option to talk about your products, um, their product availability, and even whatever other information you wanna find. But one thing I wanna point out is, because this is a food fish website, the requirement is that you raise food fish, but you're not limited to talk about your other products in this product section. So even though it is food fish focused, if you're, for example, if you're a tilapia farmer who also has some pond stalkers and you wanna share that, you can share that here too. So um, you can talk about all your products there as long as food fish is included. So right now I'm going to pivot from the Eat Midwest Fish website and we're going to change the discussion to the Great Lakes Fresh Fish Finder. So the Great Lakes Fresh Fish Finder, that's a project that's funded by Sea Grant as part of the COVID rapid response funding. So one of the things that National Sea Grant was aware of is the, the difficulty that farmers and fishers were facing in the aftermath of COVID and how our markets changed. And one of the things that was seen was is that there could be funding opportunities to try and um, be of some, develop a program that could assist farmers. And so the Great Lakes Regional Aquaculture Collaborative as a group, a subgroup in that came together to work on this project. So those two projects are funded separately, but this falls under the umbrella of the Great Lakes Aquaculture Collaborative. The Great Lakes Fresh Fish Finder is for all aquaculture and fisheries products that are being raised or harvested in the Great Lakes region. So if you are a state that touches a Great Lakes in the United States, you're eligible to have your products on this map. The website is currently in development. We're in the data collection phase. We're kind of wrapping that up. Then we're gonna go into actual website development, hoping to have that launched at the end of May of this year. Since the two websites developed at different speeds, but the same people have come together to help build those data sets, there has been a little confusion around the two different projects. So I'm hoping I can take a moment to clarify that. 
So why it's confusing is, is that we have two different defined regions. We have the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center, and then we have the Great Lakes region. And if you overlap them, we have six states that are, at, are in both regions. So we have six states where farmers are eligible for either map. So if you are in the state of Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, or Ohio, you can be on either map. And what made it a little bit more confusing is, is that because the two projects were at different timelines, you may have been contacted by multiple people. So to use Ohio as an example, um, at the time that data was being collected for the Eat Midwest Fish website, there wasn't a designated person um, in the Sea Grant program as an aquaculture specialist that was able to do that data collection early on. So you may have originally been contacted by myself or by Troy Weber. So if you're contacted by Nicole um, Wright, you might think you've already given information for the Great Lakes Fresh Fish Finder map, but you actually may have given it for the Eat Midwest Fish website. So I just say that. So. If, um, if Nicole contacts you and there's some confusion, she will be contacting you and talking about both maps because we want to be able to have um, farmers get, utilize these tools as much as they would like to. So I can't show you an illustration of what the Great Lakes Fresh Fish Finder is gonna look like, but I can show you an example so you'll have an idea on what kind of information you may want to contribute to putting on that site. It will have a map that has a pen. That pen will either be connected to your exact location or your region. You will also have an individual card. So that card will have your farm name. And it is a button that when a user clicks on that button, they're going to be connected to your individual page. So one of, the, I, one of the really cool things about this website is you have an entire page designated to talking about your product. So you can do that with both text and images, your farm name, your general information will be on there. You'll be able to link to your website and then you can talk about your business and your products including images if you want to. So if you do choose to use images to tell your story, there will be a release form that you'll need to sign allowing Sea Grant to be able to use those images on the website. So that's just a heads up. And I wanna pause just for a moment. Um, as we look at this, you can see that there's, a, you can have space for a paragraph, two more multiple pictures. So one of the things we've seen as we've been getting farmers to sign up to be on the website is they haven't been giving very much information. So like if you ask them about their product, they might say yellow perch. So, but you, you have the ability on this and on your page to describe your business, to describe your products and to tell your story. So if that's something that, you do, that you're interested in, utilize that. So in conclusion, I kind of want to wrap them up looking at them side by side so we can see their differences, where they're at and where they're going. So to review the Eat Midwest Fish website, that's for aquaculture producers that are growing food fish in the North Central region. So this is a way that you can advertise your farm and your farm products for free of charge. If you are not on the website yet, but you would like to be added, you could contact me or go to the website and there's a form that you can fill out. To review the Great Lakes Fresh Fish Finder website that's in development, we're hoping to have that launched by the end of May. It is for aquaculture and fisheries products that are raised and harvested in the Great Lakes region, and it covers all types of products. So bait fish, ornamentals, if you're pond stocking, if you have a fee fish operation, you can advertise your business here. And this is also free advertising. So if you would like to be on the Great Lakes Fresh Fish Finder map and you have not been contacted, your Ohio contact is going to be um, Nicole Wright. And then there's going to be an individual contact for each state. Um, the only 
thing that's kind of weird is if you're in the state of Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania, or you're raising food fish and not food fish in Wisconsin, you can contact myself or Troy Weber. So what's next for these? We didn't wanna just build them and hope that they would gain momentum on their own. So what's next for Eat Midwest Fish is we built the site, we launched it, and now we're gonna build content on it to drive users, to help find your products and to help find your farms. So to do that, we're gonna add more recipes, cooking demonstrations, we're gonna continue those video series, and then there'll also be some promotional materials that'll be able to be hand out when we're able to do in-person things um, that will drive people to the website. What's next for the Great Lakes Fresh Fish Finder is wrapping up that data collection, gonna build and launch the website and then secure more funding. That same team that, that built that site is gonna then make a strategic marketing plan so that we can market that product. And that concludes my summary of the two different websites. I'm kind of assuming I'm out of time since I see Matt's face. So I'll be here to answer questions later. Thanks so much, Amy. I appreciate that. That's great to see them both because I, even being an educator, I've gotten emails for both. I've gone to the MedWest website and those types of things. So it's still good to see them both side by side and realize that one's for food and one's just all aquaculture that falls within that region. So I appreciate your willingness to come and join us today. Uh, we are over just a few minutes, uh, four minutes on uh, that last presentation there. Again, attendees, don't forget to put your question and answers down in the bottom. Um, I'm sure you folks have some uh, for Amy in particular with that presentation. Again, uh, she listed her contact information, but I put all of the links that she talked about as well as her email address down in the bottom. And uh, I can put Nicole Wrights, who is Ohio Sea Grant's new educator, I can put that in the chat as well. Um, Jenny, you texted me and said that if she went over, you would like to bump later. Um, Jenny, can you go ahead and give your presentation? That does cut you a little short, but we can bump everything back just a few minutes if that's the case. That's okay. Okay. That. Absolutely. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and I will, I'll give you an extra five minutes. So at 1045 or 1043, I'll come back on and you'll cut off at 1045. Thank you. Oh, we're, we're good. We're good. So um, for those of you who don't know, I am Jenny Blackburn. I am co-owner of Fresh Harvest Farm. We do aquaponics. We raise yellow perch. And um, we've been doing this since 2011. Um, and I talk to other fish farmers and aquaponic farmers. Um, about our marketing experience. So my presentation is to share that with you. Um, I have a, I don't have a background in aquaculture at all. Actually, mine is in human resources, but the job that I worked, we did quite a bit of marketing. So I kind of had to adapt some of that to mine. So um, I first, in starting out, I wanted to define what marketing was for our business. You know, just took the standard, you know, definition I got off of Google, um, which you know, is promoting buying and selling of our products and um, had to figure out what that involved and who it involved, where it involved, what, how, um, you know, my target audience, um, where, not just that physical location, but, you know, other, other places. Um, was it going to be on websites? Was it going to be someplace like, um, you know, the websites that Amy just described um, and really define how I was going to tell my what, tell about my product. So I'll just take you through some of those that we do. So I found that quickly found out the who and the where go hand in hand. You know, um, did we want to sell to individuals? You know, farmers markets, CSAs, do events, trade shows, conferences. Did we want to just restaurants? you know, what kind of restaurants did we just, you know, with our, with our produce, then with our yellow perch, what did we want to do? Did we want to do pond stocking at eight, you know, for like state and city parks or sell to somebody like Jones Fish? And for both perch and our produce, you know, did we want to even go into and market to the wholesale industry? 
So ultimately, we started out um, at farmers markets. We felt like that was one of the best places um, to go because not only could we get our name out there, we could talk our story. Um, aquaponics was not a known form of growing at that time, and nobody knew that it involved fish and plants. Um, so it, it was a good place to go. We were able to show our product. At that time, we only did produce. Um, so we didn't really have a way of um, doing our fish at that time. We weren't even thinking food fish. So, um, however, as you can see down here, I included a picture of kingdom fish. They are um, a fish farm that raised tilapia. They do do farmer's markets. So, and this is how they take their fish. They fillet it up, it's fresh. They take it on ice and sell it at the market. As you can see, we um, took our, our plants. We actually took them live. So these plants still had roots on them. So we would harvest stuff right there in front of the person. Um, farmers markets were a good, good networking opportunity to use um, what I call word of mouth um, marketing because we met all sorts of chefs and cooks um, who would put us in contact. If they did not use us, they put us in contact with other people. Um, again, doing whether you're doing a trade show, uh, maybe um, a conference, at a conference you're, you're taking up a, a space or doing a farmer's market, you just wanna make sure that, that you represent yourself well with a, with, you know, a very appealing display. Um, one that's inviting and really one that makes people want to say, what are you raising and how can I get that? Make sure you get your farm name everywhere. Um, signage, as you can see, it tells us, uh, ours says, you know, who we are, what we do and where you can find us. Um, use, you know, brochures, business cards, pass them out. You can buy, you produce them by the thousands, pass them out. Um, put them on, you know, clothes that you wear. Um, even if you're not setting up to sell or even just talk about your, your farm, you know, wear clothing that has your farm name on it because people will remember that and then they will start and look for you. Um, marketing to restaurants, that is a little bit more difficult. You just really have to do that on a personal basis. You have to choose what restaurants you wanna to go to. If you want to just market to the local restaurant, you know, in a niche market, um, your best way is to go directly to that person that will work with the product at that location, which is usually the chef. And you will literally walk in the back door um, and you'll wanna go think about their hours of operation, what hours would be busy for them, not busy for them. Um, take them samples so that they can be impressed with what you have. Um, when you're talking to them, you know, make sure that, you know, you're marketing how you're packaging and how you'll deliver um, or have some options for them. You know, check back with them, get their feedback um, and make sure you leave with your samples, you know, your info, your business card, brochure, a price list if you have it. If you're going to try and market to one of the chain restaurants, you're going to have to go through their home office. And each one of them requires something different. You can start with the local restaurant that you want and probably the manager at that restaurant. Um, and they're gonna give you all that information. Your what is your product? Again, talk your story. People want to crave connection with local businesses and local farms. Um, there's a movement of people wanting to know where their food comes from, whether it's produce or it's a seafood product. Um, you know, talk about your product, talk about how you raise it, whether, again, whether it's produce or a, a, a seafood product. Um, tell them why they have to have your product, you know, create a need for them, you know, once, once they buy your fish, if they're going to buy it, say for food fish, and they cook it once, you know, create that need in them so that when you see them again, um, they're going to buy it, you know, buy from you, or they're always going to call you up and buy from you. Um, and that's kind of developing that trust in a bond. 
So um, how some of the hows, the word of mouth um, and, mar and referrals are really, really big, um, especially in this industry. And some people who have fish farms already know this. Um, word of mouth, I talked about, you know, networking at the farmer's markets, you meet a chef, they start using you, they recommend you to somebody else, they recommend you to somebody else, and soon you're selling to multiple people. Um, introduction to a potential buyer by someone else, again, referral. For example, one that we share is Mill Creek Perch Farm introduced us, introduced Fresh Harvest Farm to Kingdom Fish. Kingdom Fish grows tilapia. They, the one that I showed you, um, the picture there of the fillets, they sell at farmer's markets. They wanted to expand to not only sell tilapia, um, but they wanted to sell some perch. So we made that connection and we now sell perch to them. Um, ECDI loan agent. ECDI is a nonprofit um, that we worked with in the beginning of setting up our farm and the funding that we got for it. Um, that loan agent was so impressed with what we were doing. Um, she was working with another client at the time. So she introduced Fresh Harvest Farm to Harvest Pizzeria. Um, they, grow, they asked us to grow kale. So we grow kale for them and they make these awesome kale salads. Um, and it's one of their most popular products. So um, on their menu. So those can be very valuable connections. You can also market yourself through social media, Facebook, Instagram, Facebook posts. I'm showing, you know, showed the one for the Ohio Aquaculture Association for today. Um, they're both really good. They, they can hit a lot of markets. You are able to boost and promote yourself within there. Um, you need to keep your posts and your content business related on your on those pages um, and keep it engaging. Um, and really important, try to update. Um, and post as often as possible. Um, I, I, I will admit I'm really bad about that. Um, my posts sometimes aren't as um, up to date as, as possible. Um, many people ask about a website. Um, yes, we do have a website. This is an example of our landing page. We are in the process of getting ready to update our website. Um, but some people say, why have a website? Like Facebook and Instagram, a website also is today's yellow pages. That's how people, you know, when somebody says, oh, I want, I, I want something for Fresh Harvest Farm, I wonder where they're at. They're going to Google it and they're going to find the Facebook page, they're going to find the website, the Instagram page. It gives you some credibility that you are a legitimate business. And in this day and age, that is important to be credible. Um, it sets you apart. How you, what you post, how you present yourself. Um, it's a way to communicate with customers. And get, again, yellow pages get bound. And again, keep posts and content business related and engaging and update posts as often as possible. And there you go. I'm happy to take questions. And wow, really good timing. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we definitely have plenty enough uh, time there. Jenny, you can feel free to unshare your screen or leave it up in case anyone has any questions on that. Uh, but thanks so much for sharing your story there. If you have any questions, folks, make sure to put it in the question and answer uh, box, please. We did have one question that came through, um, Jenny, and we can all kind of discuss this a little bit. But they wanted to know about, um, I know you guys, guys don't really process yourself specifically, but um, someone asked about processing and packaging of fish. Uh, we'll talk about that here in just a little bit, but do you want to talk about how you guys sell your plant products um, and then how you guys work with Kingdom Fish as far as their processing goes? Sure. So um, when we, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I think I've lost my screen. Um, and I can't figure out how to stop sharing. I'm sorry. There it is. Okay. Um, so we harvest and we like to package for our, most of our clients right now are, are restaurants and they like them in you know bulk packaging. So um, we harvest and package everything in a plastic vegetable bag. 
Um, and the reason is after talking with the restaurants, um, we made the bags three pounds worth of kale, put them in these bags that basically fit, you know, the big stock of kale in. And they like that because they can cut open that bag while they're processing it, strip off the, the leaf from the stem, and they can use the, the packet, the plastic bag that it came in to roll those stems up in for um, disposal. So um, it helps keep their area, the, the processor's area clean. Um, again, Kingdom Fish with their tilapia, processing of their tilapia. He does have um, a processing facility at his farm and is HACCP um, certified. Um, so he takes his fish and our fish and he fillets them out. And he um, then bags, bags them in a Ziploc bag in which he will um, he has them labeled either small, medium, or large based on weight, and that's how he sells them. And he has another little label that he has to put on, you know, like who he is, where he's located, how to contact. Um, he also has to put on there, like, uh, I think the weight and um, the processing date and the good goodbye date, goodbye date. So, hope Thank that answers the question. Absolutely. And Jenny's allowed a farmer's cut there at their operation. Uh, other than that, uh, is I think considered processing on the plant side. And then for the question that was asked uh, regarding the fish sides of things, uh, she mentioned an acronym called HACCP. That's the Hazard Analysis of Critical Control Points. So that is uh, regulated by FDA. Sometimes your state will, um, FDA will partner with a specific state um, to send in a state regulator to go in and inspect your facility, but um, that you do have to be uh, seafood HACCP certified. I put the link in there. Uh, you have to be certified and obviously you have to process in an area that is a, an approved facility as well. And that gives you a little bit of information on there. Um, as long as you're, if you're selling uh, an entire whole yellow perch, that's what Jenny sells, uh, she can sell that as a food fish item and never put a knife to it, never pull off a head or anything like that. She can sell that as a food item without any of those regulations. But the moment a knife gets put to it, or if you are growing something like shrimp and you pull the heads off, that is considered processing as well. And you do have to go through and be seafood has some certified. I will tell you that there are restaurants that are asking um, asking about using our perch as a special specialty menu item. And I, because we do not process, I um, offer them the perch live on ice um, because I can sell it that way. Um, as, again, like Matt said, as long as I do not take a knife to it in any way, shape or form, I can sell it. Um, I can, you know, I can offer them to have them filleted out um, but then I have to pay somebody to do that, such as Kingdom Fish. If he had time to do it, um, he would charge me to have that done. So, um, and that does affect the price that I would sell it for. Um, but it's all, it, it's, an, it's an, another revenue stream for us that we are um, working with. And in fact, in the last year, we have had, year and a half, I should say, we've had a lot of inquiries into it. And, um, hopefully once you know restaurants here here open up again and they can expand their menus because many restaurants have a limited menu they will um i mean i've already had one ask you know will you have availability this summer of perch and i'm i'm like yes in fact i have the availability almost all year round since we grow indoors so um hopefully that'll take off so um i noticed in the question session um that Ke kenneth is asking um, whether it's aquaculture or aquaponics sites that provide information to price your products. Um, so as far as the produce side of it, um, you can go to the, um, you, the organic market websites and I can't tell you off the top of my head what those are. Um, I, I always Google organic wholesale market and up with price list um, and get the region that's closest to where you are. Um, you know, there are websites where you can find how much people are selling um, different um, species of 
fish and seafood for. Um, you know, in network, you know, as part of the, um, you know, Ohio Aquaculture Association, we have good networking. You can usually reach out to other fish farmers and they're happy to share um, information. Um, Noelle, I think that there is, are some marketing techniques that work better. Sure. Hey Jenny, I'll I'll let you think on these two questions from okay. Noel. We are we are we we will answer these Noel, and we can dive in more Ken on your questions. But we are going to proceed with the next yeah. one. Uh, yeah, that's I, good I, at I, the end. I knew the farmer. Uh, when the farmers come on, there's always lots of questions to to chat with the sure. farmers. I will say uh, that's an important distinction though, because most restaurants are not going to be seafood HACCP certified, but um, they are going to be. Uh, approved to do processing and things of that nature and uh, as a result of their county regulations so that they can do whatever they want within uh, within their kitchen uh, but it does make it more difficult all right so again we will answer those closer to the end keep the questions coming think about what you heard from both jenny and amy now we're going to proceed uh, with ivory ivory's with ohio farm bureau and uh Ivory, I'll give you a few minutes over as well. So I'll, I'll turn my screen back on at about 1115. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you all. So I'm going to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, marketing channels for seafood and produce, how to find and approach buyers. And really my goal in this is for to share the different channels with you and help you identify the right channel and then how to find and approach those buyers. As we're gonna see in this presentation, depending on how you produce and your volume of sales, each channel works a little bit differently. So throughout this presentation, I'm gonna to refer to each set of channels a little bit differently. So let's define what I'm talking about. When I say direct marketing channels, I'm talking about the farmer's market. Uh, Jenny showed beautiful pictures of their farmer's market there. You might be selling direct from the farm. It looked like Kingdom Farms did some of that as well. Uh, maybe a local directory. So many extension offices now have a local foods directory. Many county farm bureaus also have local foods directories where you can be listed for free as someone who's producing local food. And then they put that out to folks in the area. Having a CSA, so many of you in aquaponic systems have both fish and produce. Um, what a beautiful marriage of things to offer within a CSA or to partner with an existing produce producer and just provide fish is another idea for direct to consumer sales. E-commerce is another one. And I really liked hearing about uh, Amy's websites as initiatives for locating farms, but also just to show that people are not only going online to see where they can find local food, they're buying online. Many of you might be familiar with ButcherBox or Piedmontese. These are both nationwide protein providers. Um, some of them, I know ButcherBox, for example, does also provide fish within their boxes of proteins. So 10 years ago, people would have been like, buy, buy meat online? Are you kidding me? Like, that's a little scary. These days, people are buying just boxes of proteins. They're buying meal kits, like from HelloFresh. E-commerce is on the rise. In the case of direct sales, this might be offering a a web platform like Shopify or Weebly from your website. So folks can go to Jenny's Farms website, purchase a box of frozen fish online, and then have that show up at their door. You can add those kinds of things to your website pretty easily with services like Shopify. The next set of marketing channels are intermediated. So these are the small and specialty grocers in your communities. That might be a caterer that you're providing to. Meal prep companies, so in Fairfield County, I live um, not far from there, I've noticed two new meal prep companies, one focusing on home cooked food, one focusing on healthy keto, gluten free, special dietary lifestyle food. Fish can fit and produce can fit into both of those kind of food systems. So meal prep companies. A butcher shop, a local butcher shop that's offering pork, beef, and also potentially some fish. We have one of those in our community. A local restaurant, and when I mean local, these are, like Jenny mentioned, you go through the back door, you talk directly with the chef. So chains are a little bit different. We'll cover those later. Food trucks, who doesn't like fish tacos? I know I do. Food trucks 
are another great thing that is sometimes we don't think of as local producers. A great thing about food trucks is that they use smaller volumes. So if you're a new producer looking to get into restaurants, a food truck might bring you there. Uh, independent institutions. So I'm thinking automatically of church fish fries. If it's an independent institution where you're working with one buyer to make the sale, that is an intermediated channel or a local bed and breakfast um, or a small cafe, something like that. Those are all intermediated channels. And perhaps the largest and most complex are middlemen. So these are your distributors and brokers. Notably, with each channel, there's increasing complexity. That's increasing complexity in the marketing, in your product, in the packaging, in the sale itself. There's increasing complexity. So if you're new to marketing, I would suggest starting with a direct channel, learning, growing, getting that customer feedback that Jenny talked about, improving your product and packaging to make it to the next level um, and building your way as you go. So we're going to look now at each of these channels. We're going to talk about the pros and cons to help you make a decision which channel is best for you. And then we'll talk about how you find them. So direct to consumer. These are your farm, farm markets from the farm. Some pros, entries. So this is a great entry level place to start selling your seafood and produce. You can create those super fans that are going to do that word of mouth that Jenny was talking about. So people that love your product, that run home and tell all their friends, go to the farmer's market next weekend, visit um, Fresh Harvest Farms. They had the best fish, the best kale and Swiss chard. It was just beautiful and green. It was still growing and she harvested it in front of me. You can create those super fans. Build your customer base. Starting with direct to consumers is also going to provide you with sales data so when you're ready to go to those intermediated markets you go in saying hey these are what my sales are i've increased my volume this is what they can be that's a great way to convince the next level that you are trustworthy credible and have a good high quality product they're going to help you understand your customers needs so people that come back that say, you know, um, the consistency from what I got that last week to this week was, was different. Why is that? You're going to gain a lot of insight to improving your product. This will allow you to work out your pricing, your volume, and your product quality, and also the consistency of your product. Within direct sales, the profit is all yours. And what I mean is when you get into intermediated markets, or middlemen markets, there's going to be a margin or there's going to be additional costs that mean you're going to walk away with less of that dollar in your pocket. With direct sales, you do make more. Of course, there's more work involved with that as well. And again, you know, e-commerce is on the rise. We talked about that already. So utilizing that to your benefit with direct sales. Some big cons with the direct to consumer market is the time and effort. So Jenny didn't mention that, but I'm sure they had a lot of short um, nights getting ready for those farmers markets in the morning. There's a lot of time and effort. And we all know as farmers that most of us have day jobs. So most of us don't have the opportunity to do this full time. And maybe we can only do a Saturday farmer's market, not even a middle market. There's a lot of time and effort. It's not really scalable. So you're gonna to get to a level, you might be selling all you can at a farmer's market or from the farm. It's really hard to increase your volume and continue to grow your business with only direct to consumer sales. And the seasonality. So we're not affected as much of that in aquaponic systems. However, because you're growing indoors, however, there is there are seasonal components and that can be tough because the farmer's market is only these times a year. What do you do if you're in aquaponics and you have produce and fish year round? So how do you find direct channels? Well, USDA has local food directories. You can Google that and get listed. Um, Amy shared the eatmidwestfish.org and greatlakesfreshfishfinder.com. Those are a couple of great examples that you could get listed in right now. There's also those print local directories that I talked about through your county extension office or also your county farm bureau office. 
If you are looking to send direct mail, I would encourage you all to check out USPS Every Door Direct and Inform Delivery Service. So what this is, is a service you can sign up for and you can target folks in your local area. You can produce a list of addresses to send marketing messages to folks in your community. So that is through USPS and you can just give that a Google and look at that, um, create highly targeted direct mail. I also suggest everyone use research databases to find customers. So if you are going to do direct mail or some kind of mailing, some kind of promotion, and you want folks that are within 100 miles of you, if you have a library card from the Columbus Library, which you can get online, you don't need to live in Columbus, you can use a database called Demographics Now or Reference Solutions and produce lists of potential prospects and create mailers off of those. I would also suggest you pitch your story to publications. So um, our Ohio is an Ohio Farm Bureau publication. There was recently an article in there about a fish farm that produced caviar that was really interesting. People love to hear about what's going on and it's new and innovative at local farms. So I would suggest you do that. You can also write a press release, Google a template. Let's say you have a new frozen fish product, write a press release about that. Get it in your local papers and have those folks link to your farm. You can host an on-farm event. So as a Farm Bureau organization director, I am always looking for places to host uh, policy sessions, to host community gathering. If you have a big barn and you would be willing to give a tour, I would suggest reaching out to your county Farm Bureau. It's a great way to get customers and engage people in your business. You can participate in an event as a vendor or an educator like Jenny just did. So now we all are going to go look at her website, learn about her production um, because of that great presentation. There's cooperative marketing, so working with other farmers. You can also do some social media advertising, which Jenny talked about. I would suggest boosted posts and Google ads or I'm sorry, Facebook ads it makes it pretty simple. Um, there's also Google AdWords where you can purchase words at a reduced rate rental rate and set ads. So when you do a Google search for fresh fish near me, you're going to come up with that little ad um, on your Google search results. So that's relatively inexpensive to do as well. And also newsletters. So again, uh, County Farm Bureau's produce newsletters. I would love if someone in one of my counties reached out to me and said, hey, I wanna talk about my aquaponics system and why this could be a way for folks in the city to produce uh, fresh fish and produce for sale. Um, that's a neat article. I would love to share that if that was happening in one of my counties. So next we're gonna talk about intermediated markets. So again, those caterers, meal prep co's, small and specialty grocers. Some pros is there are great opportunities in these small local restaurants, um, non-chain type situations for local food and sustainably produced food and organic food, the stuff you guys are selling. You will get great advice on your product packaging and price. You will perfect it. So when you're ready to go to the, inter to the larger middlemen markets, your stuff's on point. In intermediated markets, you can move a greater volume at once than you can with direct sales. You're also gonna build your brand. So um, selling to a restaurant, for example, um, and perhaps you can do a promotion with that restaurant where you're actually at the restaurant and I would love it if Jenny served as a host and they were doing a special with her produce at a restaurant and her fish. And I sat down at the table and Jenny came in and said, hi, I'm Jenny. My, their special is this tonight. This fish was on my farm. Here's some of my beautiful marketing materials that she showed us. You know, I might have gone in that restaurant to buy steak and I'm going to get fish because that's really neat. I'm also going to look up Jenny's farm after that because I found it really interesting. So um, you can participate in promoting your product at some of these. And there, there are many sales models as well. So in a small grocer, for example, uh, Keller Market House in Lancaster, they're on a commission-based structure. So if a folks are selling fresh, um, I'm sorry, frozen fish, they're gonna stock their own, they're gonna maintain freezer space basically, set their own prices. That's not necessarily true in a small IGA right? So you're going to go in there and they're going to set the prices and stock it for you and also pay you um, on a net 40 or a net 60 basis. So there are many sales models. Cons, retail markup can be up to 30%. Logistics, 
uh, perishable products. That can be tough, especially if you're doing the kale and the leafy greens. I thought it was ingenious when Jenny showed us those plants alive, because if you've ever brought lettuce to a farmer's market, you know it's not gonna last very long and look very good very long, unless you do something like Jenny did where the plant was still alive. It might require delivery on multiple days. Again, if you're the farmer that has a day job like 90% of farmers in Ohio, that might be troublesome for you. Your sales might be intermittent, depending on menu and seasonality. You're gonna need additional permits and licenses to sell at this level. And it may require a certified processing facility. How do you find intermediated channels? Street Food Finder is awesome to find food trucks. So that's a great way. Edible Magazine, so this is local food focused. There's lots of ads in there of the kinds of folks that are gonna want to you to deliver those fish on ice, right? So they're gonna want and to be able to process that in house and do that. If you go to uh, Applebee's, they're not interested in processing that fish. They wanna take a frozen thing out of a bag uh, and be able to do that. So you're, you're looking for the kinds of restaurants that are gonna be in edible, the kinds of high quality local touch restaurants. Those are inedible. The Knot, it's a wedding magazine. Why would I be sending you there? Well, because caterers. And you, typically at a wedding, there is some kind of white uh, meat or some kind of vegetarian meal. And there is a set amount. I would love to have local food served at a wedding. So that's a way to find caterers. Yelp is another great way to find intermediated markets um, with searching for local foods or local foods restaurants. Google, again, and USDA local food registries. Last but not least, middlemen. So these, uh, this is the highest, most complex market. There are basically two. You're dealing with brokers, you're dealing with distributors. What is the difference? A broker does not take possession of your product. A distributor may or may not um, have a sales component to the product. However, a distributor will always take possession of your product. So the broker is basically, think of the broker as the agent of your product. They're just making that sales connection. A distributor is taking your product to the final location of the sale. They're doing the logistics for you. Both of them are gonna allow you to move a greater volume. Distributors are more expensive because they're doing more work. So they're gonna ask you for, uh, they're gonna add a 10 to 15% margin on that. As where a broker is a five to 8% commission only if they sell your product. So um, a great thing about brokers is they usually have specialty expertise. So that's um, branding, packaging, um, knowing those UPC, nutrition labels, verified claims like USDA organic, they can assist you with that. Distributor, you're gonna need to have all that worked out um, before you get in with a major distributor. And again, you know, with both, there's a net 45 to 60. What does that mean? That means you give them, the distributor, your product, and you're not going to get paid for a couple months. So knowing that there's going to be some cash flow things with working with distributors. So I want you all to mark your calendar for November 1st through 2nd, 2021. This is the Mid-America Restaurant Expo. And it is not just restaurants there, there are food products there. There are also distributors and brokers and packaging experts there. Um, one of the most fascinating things is I found a label specialist for frozen foods. So if you are vacuum sealing frozen foods, you know the labels smear, they slide all over. Someone I met at the restaurant expo actually makes frozen for frozen fish, frozen beef, uh, labels that don't stick and smear. You can find anything there. I would suggest going and talking with distributors and talking with these intermediate markets, meeting the brokers. One thing I learned from talking to a major uh, seafood and protein distributor last or two years ago at the market is that he didn't even look unless he could move 400 head of grass-fed cattle at once. So that was that is a big that is a big farm, right? So he wasn't working even he didn't even consider anything less than that. Most of his products came from out west, but that's a good thing to know. What are the different levels just for a learning activity? So I would suggest you all attend that. Um, also research databases. I talked about my handy library card at Columbus. You can use Privco, uh, DNB, which is a million dollar, DNB million dollar database or reference solutions and search for seafood distributors, seafood brokers and pull up a list right there and do some research online. 
I would also suggest loading with noticing which distributors are at loading docks. I was in Hocking County the other day and I saw Richie's food distribution at a local business. Well, Richie's is a food distribution company out of Pike County. And I thought that was very interesting that they also are serving small uh, bed and breakfast up here. So um, notice who is where. Also asking other sellers who their distributors are and talking with managers and buyers at stores uh, who is doing their distribution. One thing I will mention is places like Kroger and Walmart, they have their own distributors. So if you go to Walmart and you say, hey, I have the most beautiful kale in the world, um, they're gonna say, you're gonna need to go down to Washington Courthouse Food Distribution or Distribution Center. They only work through their own self distributors. So that's important to know. And also the same is true of Kroger out of Cincinnati. So how do you approach? Well, first you want to call ahead to make an appointment to talk with these folks. You don't wanna catch them off guard, they're busy people. You want to bring professional marketing materials. Jenny's were beautiful. She showed you some of those cards, some of the brochures that they have made for their farm. You're gonna to wanna to bring samples. She mentioned that too. People will want to interact with your product. You need to know your pricing for the market channel that you're in. You may have sold that beautiful fish at one price of, with direct sales. You aren't gonna get that price when you are selling to a restaurant. So know those things, walk in, know what your bottom line is, know what, you, know what your, the middle ground is and know what you'd like to get. You want sales data. So I talked about indirect sales channels, being able to uh, aggregate data, your selling and your volume and what it could be. So you can present that very professionally when you approach these larger markets. You'll need to know your customer. So know your customer segments. Is the fish and produce selling to health conscious consumers? Are you typically selling to people within 50 miles from your farm? Or are you willing to ship? And if you are, how far? Have that all investigated before you approach these buyers. No delivery schedule and logistics. So this is a tough one with restaurants, especially restaurants that open for lunch and dinner. So know what you are capable of and make sure to ask them what they need. And um, I have a friend who has a farm who raises produce and also beef. And she sells to local restaurants. While she also has kids, she has to get on the bus. She also has commitments in the morning. They want her to deliver at a specific time Thursday morning. And she had to rearrange her schedule to be able to do that. She's able to do that because that is, she doesn't have a day job. If she was working a nine to five, that would be something that she couldn't do. So just keep in mind, there's gonna be demands and they're going to be uh, very specific to when they can accept that. To even small restaurants aren't going to say, yeah, just drop it by when, when you can drop by. For the most part, they want that all coming in at once to minimize the traffic they're having come through the kitchen and the logistics and the billing and the invoicing and that. So take note of that. Notice the shape and size of packaging. And this is mostly for those small specialty stores or butcher grocers. You need to fit in their established situation. They're not going to make a special display, a special freezer space to fit your packaging in a certain way. You have to do that for them. So go pre-appointment and kind of look at what's around, how are things being displayed, what is the size of the packaging. And also know your volume. So know what you can deliver and when you can deliver it in terms of volume. That is all I have for you. I am happy to answer any questions um, either now or if we wanna tackle those later. Uh, one thing I did want to give you a heads up on next week, the value added producer grant, uh, which is a USDA grant closes. So this is a grant that can be used to add value to farm uh, commodities such as fish. So if you're creating a fish product and you need processing funds, funds for marketing, funds for sales staff, um, I would suggest you all Google the value added rural development uh, USDA grant and look at that. If not for this year, then maybe next year to consider what you can do. If you're producing bait fish, for example, and you're thinking hmm, maybe food fish is something I wanna do, check out that grant. Um, see how that can help you in grow and expand your business. Great job, Ivory. Thanks so much. 
Uh, just because you mentioned food trucks, I had to post a picture of from, we did a homesteading workshop back in 2019. We actually did it at Jenny's farm. We talked about a lot of stuff, but the, um, um, this, uh, sorry, there's a, someone posted down the chat, uh, but they actually processed Jenny's perch for her, And so they served um, a perch that day, uh, which was really cool right there on the farm, but it was a homesteading workshop. So we talked about chickens and produce and everything else. So very, very cool, I agree. Thanks so much. We do have some questions here uh, and let me pull them up. We've got just a few minutes. If we don't get to them, we will um, obviously let Dr. KK talk and then we'll go through it. All right, so this one's for Ivory. It says, hello, Ivory. Do you have any information on the size of the business, for example, income uh, per year that would be pertinent or restrictive or prohibitive basically talking about the direct, intermediate, and middlemen, kind of, if you're a small farmer, you should kind of focus this way. If you're a larger farmer, you can focus through this avenue. So not necessarily. Uh, I, I would recommend that you really think about your volume and you let that really guide where you're going. Um, let me give you some examples. I, I shared that you know, I was talking with that man that was a distributor at the restaurant expo and he said, hey, I don't even look at farms that aren't going to be able to provide me with 400 head of finished cattle at once. Right. So in those distributor um, broker type middlemen channels, your volume, you just might not be able to get there as a single farm. However, if you are interested in getting into restaurants, that might be different. Right. And um, you might be able to produce at that volume level. Similarly, maybe you are a very small city farm, you're an urban farm, but you are producing a lot because we've seen that in aquaponic systems. Um, and so then I would say to grow your business, you really need to move up into that intermediated market channel. You're going to have to go there at some point, uh, probably as you continue to scale. The only trouble with direct sales, it's the most profitable. It's a great place to start. But the only problem with direct sales is it is really hard to scale. And so I don't see a lot of small farms growing past a certain point um, of their business. Um, so that's something usually around the five to seven year mark that folks start to consider. Like, how am I gonna be able to grow this beyond just direct sales, if that's a goal of yours? Um, and some small farms staying in those direct to market sales um, relying on uh, word of mouth, for example, that's really their bread and butter. And they're not interested in growing more than that. And you can do very well with just direct sales. Thanks so much, Ivory. Uh, someone did ask a question and then we'll proceed um, uh, with Kwamina. They wanna know, uh, doesn't the VAPG close on May 4th? That may just be something we need to Google. I think related to the grant. Yeah, so um, I will have to double check that on my calendar. I have the 22nd, uh, but that does not mean I am right. That might be me looking at the wrong year. So I will double check on that while we go through the next presentation and I will have an answer for you at uh, our Q&A here at the end. Thanks so much, Ivory. And if you could please provide a link for folks, that would be great while you're doing that. Will do. All right, thanks so much, Ivory. You can go ahead and stop sharing your screen. And next, we're going to have uh, Dr. Kwamina Quagrani talk about marketing food, fish, and shrimp from his end. All right, Kwamina, uh, I, we can see your screen. It's not in full size. Yes, yes, sir. It is not in full size, but uh, I'll uh, I'll stop you at about um, 11, 11.40 or so. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we hear you just fine and we can see your screen in full, uh, full screen. Yep, and we can see you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, and I'm glad that I've been invited to, you know, join this webinar this Saturday. And thanks everybody for your time. I know the weather is getting nice. So Saturday's a precious time for many of us. Um, what I'm going to talk about is pretty much emphasizing what many of our speakers have said, Amy, Jenny, and Ivory have said. Um, a couple of things that I want to reemphasize. 
from what we've heard so far, you know, one thing you should keep in mind is that uh, the buying patterns of consumers uh, have changed. You know, the, the, the habits have changed. We've heard about local foods, we've heard about e-shopping, and now there's a lot of home cooking also going on. Uh, people want to be self-sufficient and trying to cook from the scratch. Others, you know, are demanding more convenience foods. Because of COVID, you know, finances are really tight. And so there's kind of a drop in eating out and a lot of home cooking. So that is something that as fish producers, we, we have to keep in mind that the, the spending habits and the shopping habits have changed. So there's this report that came out uh, about a month ago from the Food Marketing Institute. And they did a survey uh, 20, 2020, looking at how seafood has fared with other, other food items. So they, in that report, they said that seafood sales was up 28%. And it generated about 16.6 .6 billion in sales for food retailers. But compare that to produce, to meat, and let uh, Delhi department. You see that sales of seafood really shot up during the pandemic, during 2020. Uh, produce 11%, meats almost 19%, and Delhi department just 1%. So that tells you that you know we might all be complaining about COVID, but I think it's an opportunity for the seafood industry, particularly aquaculture industry, to really tap into the increase in, in seafood sales and seafood demand. In that report, these are some of the you know, statistics that they report. They said 36% more consumers are cooking seafood. And that is a good thing. People are cooking seafood. So that means the availability is going to be very important. 53% are cooking more meals with seafood. And 75% of seafood consumers, they want more knowledge about how to cook it, how to prepare it, and how to flavor their seafood. And on that, 20% of the consumers, they look to food retailers at their seafood counters as to how to prepare. 18% are looking at websites and apps for guidance as to how pre to prepare seafood. So some of the things that Amy had talked about with the website and recipes and those things, that come really come into play here that as people are looking more into preparing seafood, they need the guidance to really do it well for all species that we are dealing with. And this is a chart in that report. Um, they say that you know, they ask them, why are they eating more seafood? And so 59% said they are trying to eat healthier. So there is that understanding among consumers that seafood is a healthy protein. 44% uh, is seeking more variety in their diet. 40% they want to eat more proteins and 30% is because restaurants are closed and they are cooking more seafood at home. That's why they are eating more seafood. And then in terms of price, 27% uh, think that seafood price is better compared to other proteins. And as usual, some are bored at home and so they are looking at different things they want to do. So these are some of the information that I think should help fish farmers and to help anybody producing fish to really think about you know, the customers, the consumers, what, with the, what they are looking for, what they are interested in. So I'm going to talk about three things. These things have been mentioned already. I'm just going to emphasize them. So the first is to really do your homework. You, you need to understand the market that you are getting yourself in, into and Jenny, you know, told us how she, she did hers. And Ivory also told us about the direct and the indirect and intermediate all. So know who these customers are. You know, can you identify them? 
Who, what are they looking for? How can I reach them? And even to reach them, do I need any alliances, you know, in the local community to reach these customers? So doing your background and your homework and your research is very, very important. So that especially when you are, if you are new to this, uh, to aquaculture, and if you are new to trying to create a market for what you are producing, doing some background research is very important. And Jenny, no, not Jenny, Ivory pro provided some information about where to get some information about customers. And so once you get these customers, you need to determine what are they looking for? What do they need? You know, and if they are looking for fish, why do they need the fish? And you can see from the uh, Food Marketing Institute uh, survey that there are many reasons people are cooking fish at home. But at least you need to identify why are they looking for fish and where are these people and how often do they need the fish? Do they need it regularly? I mean, if they are bored at home and they want to try something new, do they need it occasionally? So once you identify who these customers are, these consumers are, and identifying what they are looking for and why they are looking for, and then you also look at in what form. And Jenny also talked about some aspect of processing. That's also very, very important. So once you, you know, identify these things, then try to ask yourself, this is a marketplace. So there are other people who are also selling fish. You know, if you are doing yellow perch, if you are doing tilapia, others are also doing it. But then what is different from yours? How does yours, you know, uh, what distinguish your tilapia or your trout or your yellow perch from other food fish that uh, is being, you know, uh, supplied to the market? So some of the things are quality, taste, freshness. Those are things that you need to think about. So note that the consumer is who you are looking for. The customer is who you are looking for. Whether you are going the direct way or the intermediate way, you need to satisfy them what they are looking for. And at the end of the day, you are looking for profit. So make sure that, you know, in any way that you are supplying your fish to these customers, whether directly or through the intermediate ways, you are going to make profit and you are satisfying them. Whatever they are looking for, you try as much as possible to meet that need. And note that marketing is not a one-time thing. It's a process. So you need time to generate the market. And I'll talk a little bit in my next slides about relationship. You need to generate the market and then Jenny, I think, also talk about feedback. So you need to get feedback and then refine how you are, I mean, how you are packaging or how you are presenting your, your fish to these customers. Because it's not a one time thing that I have this fish, this is what they are looking for, I give it to them. And that always does what it's going to be. Note that the, the market keeps changing, consumers keep changing what they are looking for, it keeps on changing all the time. And, uh, you know, the product differences are short term. They last weeks, months, not years. So things keep changing. The consumers keep changing what they are looking for. So you have to refine your marketing, you know, strategy, evaluate all the information you are getting. And as you are evaluating them, you are making the changes. And so improve your understanding of, of the whole marketing process. And you have to keep monitoring what the changes are in the marketplace. Another, another aspect you need to think about is pricing because you, you want to make profit. And so there are different kinds of pricing. Uh, you have the cost plus pricing where you just cover your costs with a little bit of profit margin. Then you have value-based. A value base is more of what you think the customer or the consumer values what you are giving to them. 
So if they think what you are giving to them is really valuable, then you can sell more than what uh, covers costs. And then competition, especially if you are in a place where there are so many competitors, so many other people selling fish, then you probably need to re-examine how you can stay in business by pricing competitively. And then we have seasonality up also that we need to be mindful of. So value pricing, it's something that you need to focus on the customer. How, what you are supplying or what you are selling. So whether it's intermediate, let's say a local restaurant. What do you think is the value of what you are giving your restaurant owner, whether it's the chef or the owner? What is the value of, of what you are supplying to them? Maybe it's something that it's readily available to them. That's the value they, they, they uh, attach to your product, that anytime they need something, it's readily available. Or we've been talking about local, we've been talk, talking about freshness. So those are some of the things that they consider valuable to them. Not necessarily the price of it, especially if you look at some of these local restaurants, who have a special seafood on Fridays and Saturdays, mainly the weekends when they know they have a lot of customers. They value certain things that you know, they present on their menu. So if you have fish and you are supplying some of these, it's the value that really counts. And people don't mind paying for it because they are specials, you know, they, they, because it's not there all the time. So, they place some value to some of these things. The second point I want to mention is to build relationships. And Jenny mentioned a lot of this. Uh, and I think Ivory also mentioned some of, some of this. Marketing, as I said, it's, it's a process. So you can't do it alone. You need partnerships. You know, you, you need to connect with people. You need to leverage your com community. Uh, what is going on, local, local food systems, CSAs, farmers market. So there are so many community networks available that you can leverage and use that relationship to promote and to sell your fish. That's very important. Uh, it's, you know, you can start it on your own, but eventually to get established, you need some cooperation and partnerships from, from your local, uh, lo local networks. So through these local networks, you can build a customer base. So whether you are looking at food hubs, food co-ops, CSAs, uh, caterers, restaurants, community kitchens, these are all resources available in your community and you can use that to build a customer base. That's very important. And as you build a customer base and they come to know you, they come to know your, your products, then you begin growing from there. And that way, once you have an established customer base, you know you can grow from there. So that's, that's something you have to keep in mind. One of the things I like uh, mentioning is that marketing is like having a, firm, a farmer mentality. So as we all know, farmers cultivate the land and then as they cultivate and they sow, eventually they get some yield and some harvests from what they've done. And it's the same with marketing. We have to cultivate the relationship. So as we cultivate that relationship, as we grow the relationship, it helps us to really establish that customer base. And then we also need to nurture the customers. You know, get in touch with your customers frequently, get feedback from them. How, I mean, how do, you, how do they find your product? Any, any good, good and bad about it, how you can improve it, not only you know, the product itself, it could be packaging, it could be something else, you know. So as you, as you establish this relationship, continue to nurture that relationship and grow that relationship. That's very, very important. And especially 
for those who do direct uh, marketing, even with the intermediate, the direct marketing. Know that working closely with your customers, as uh, Ivory said, they will continue to spread the word on their own by word of mouth, helping you to share their helping you to share their experience from what they got from you. So that relationship is very important. Those who sell to the live market, it's very important to establish that relationship. If you are selling to ethnic markets, it's very important. Local grocery, local restaurant. So that personal touch with that personal story helps establish that relationship that will make you to grow your customer base and also to market your fish. And the third point and my last point here is that you need to have a plan. You know, all that Amy talked about, Jenny talked about, Ivory talked about, you have to have a plan. You know, the plan will help you to really put something on paper and follow a pathway to get your product sold every time. So it's very important that you have a plan in place because marketing has shifted from just a product to the customer to a transactional relationship. So have a plan. How do you, you know, go from your farm to the end user? And so if you have this plan, and everything is set out well, then you, know, you can follow it. And again, it comes back to reviewing the market, monitoring the market, revising the plan, always to adapt it to meet your, your marketing goals. So there are three tests you need to use to assess your plan. Is it realistic? It's a, I mean, it's, it's a plan that you should test whether it's a reality. A, a market really does exist for your fish. That's what you want to prove from that, that there is a market, people will buy my fish. Then the competitive test, because we, you all know that it's a competition out there. You are not the only person in the marketplace. There are other products available. Even if it's not the same, there are different forms of fish being sold. So in the competition, are you able to survive this competition? How am I better than other, other farmers in, in the eyes of the, of the customers? And then the value test. And the value test is make sure that even as you market it and, and provide some value to your customers, you are able to cover your cost because you don't want to get into a business where at the end of the day, you know that things are not, um, you know, the numbers are not adding up. So it's very important you, you address that as well. So with that plan, you need to be better organized to ensure that you are making profit. In that plan, you have specified who your customers are, what are the opportunities, and then uh, the type of products you are going to supply to them. And then how you are different from other customers. All these things need to be laid out clearly in a plan that you need to follow, especially for those who are even now going to try to get into it. Sometimes when you want some financing, you get the banks wanting to see what your marketing plan is because they want to make sure that eventually when you produce the fish, you are going to, you are going to sell it. So that's very important. Uh, have a personal touch. Uh, and a story behind your fish, and we've heard uh, about that. So in summary, uh, note that we are producing for profit. That's very important. You might be all you know, excited about producing your fish, but at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you are making money. Keep the customer in mind, because at the end of the day, that is what you want to capture. You want to capture as much of what the customer is going to pay or what the consumer is going to pay. And then do your research. And that research, make sure that it's a process, you revise it, you adjust it, you adapt to all the new changes that are taking place in the, in the marketplace. So I want to uh, plug in something here and I'll 
show you a, a fly about it. One of the things that many farmers have been wanting to do is to look for ways that you know they could have some form of certification. I wouldn't say certification, but more of approval process for what they, they have, like traceability, you know, no antibiotics is sustainable, no hormones. USDA has a, a program called the PVP, the Process Verified Program. And that helps farmers, you know, to, do, to develop some process uh, for themselves. And with that, they can use that as a stamp on the products that they are, uh, the products that they are selling. And so people have been doing it, companies have been doing it for the other meats, but we haven't really seen it in, in the seafood uh, industry. So we are organizing um, a webinar, I would say webinar or, you know, uh, a presentation by USDA, uh, two, two individuals from USDA who are in charge of this program, the process verified on uh, process verified program on March 24th. Uh, we are we are going to start publicizing this from from next week, and you'll hear more about it. And they are going to tell us about this program and how fish farmers can really utilize this program for, especially if you are selling directly to consumers directly or directly through restaurants and things like that. This is something that a seal that you can get once you go through the process and you know you can stick you know claim to certain things to your product, you can use it you know to market your fish. So you hear more about this coming from next week. So that's all what I have for today. And if you have any question, I think as we get into the panel discussion. I'll be happy to answer any question on that. Thank you. Great job, Kwamina. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, your, your last summary was produce your product for a profit, which sounds like the most simplistic thing in the world, but you and I both are extension specialists and a lot of people just fall in love with the idea of growing a fish or a shrimp and the, the marketing is not and, and even making money on it a lot of times just it's assumed it will come uh, without doing the due diligence so we appreciate you taking the time uh, today with uh, with that and I really liked your passing the three tests slide there at the end okay um, we do have a couple questions here I also have a bunch for myself so if no one else um, asks them I can certainly chime in with my questions here um, but feel free, everyone on the uh, who is on the panel, to turn on your screens, and I will put myself in a gallery view. Uh, again, feel free to put your questions in the chat there. Um, so we we kind of answered already, and I'll go back to the top again. Thank you all for joining with us today. Um, so this question, um, I, and I guess I'll just see if anyone else uh, wants to chime in because Jenny discussed a little bit with the USDA work for the produce side, but can ask whether, uh, what kind of information is out there regarding pricing your products. And so whoever else, uh, I guess whether it's seafood or on the plant side, if anyone else wants to chime in other than what Jenny mentioned with the um, USDA work. Or I'll just pick on Ivory or Kwamina. If, if you guys have anything else to add, if not, uh, then I, uh, we will certainly let it go. Well, I'll share what I know. Um, there, on the USDA websites, there it gives you a great idea, right? So it gives you a place to start. But as we all know of producers, my small herd of beef cattle is much, much more expensive for me to produce beef than it is for someone with much larger that's gaining an economy of scale. So um, take that information from the USDA on what prices are going for as good information, but you really need to hone in on what your cost to produce your fish or produce product is um, to get a reasonable idea of what your what it takes you to produce it so you can have a profit. And I think that a lot of producers shy away from doing that because it's hard. 
especially in aquaponic systems where you have a lot of energy inputs and you have a lot of considerations that you might not have in a traditional agriculture system. However, um, I would say get really close, as close as you possibly can on knowing what it costs you on in your farm to produce your product, your cost of goods sold, and then set your pricing according. The other part, you know, look into, like Jenny mentioned, the USDA, also look at your competitors. So you certainly don't want to just price your product a little lower than your competitor, never a good idea, because again, your farm is unique and your production is unique. But look at what the going rate is for both local fish like yours and local produce like yours, but also those frozen fish products that we don't let, we like to pretend don't exist, those imported um, products that are our competitors, because it's a lot lower and you are not going to be able to produce, but those aren't going to be the same customers you're going for. You need to know what your customers' options are when they go to the grocery store, and that will help inform It, I think Ivory froze up there. Um, the other thing that um, I can say on that is when when we first started, we I went every every food store like you know Kroger, Whole Foods, Giant Eagle, and saw what they were selling product the products for um, to get just that pricing. And then I also went to farmers markets to see what other farmers were selling for. So that when we went into the market, we were going in, you know, competitively. Um, and at farmers markets, there's also kind of this unspoken rule that you cannot undercut other farmers that are selling the same products there. So you really have to stay, you know, look at that and compare and make your prices there, especially for the produce side. Um, for the fish side, I have also gone to, there's like uh, here in Columbus, Ohio, there's a specialty um, seafood place called the Fish Guys at North Market. And they source, they try to source as much locally in Ohio as they can, but they do bring in from other places. You know, you can go and see like, for me, what are they selling a perch filet for or a whole perch? I can look at that price. I can also look at the grocery stores if they happen to have it. So, um, you know, do do that kind of research locally for pricing. And I, I, I'll agree to that. And also add that a lot depends on how you are going to sell, whether it's directly or, you know, the intermediate that Ivory talked about and your location. Because uh, if you are close to a city, uh, you know, where you have a high customer base, you know, your pricing may be different from where you are really rural and your customer base is, is very small. Uh, if I take shrimp as an example, you know, there are people who are in locations, they are able to sell 18 to $20 a pound on the farm, but there are other people in certain locations that nobody will pay that, you know, for that. So your location also is very important. Thanks, guys. Appreciate that. So I'm, I'm, I marked that one complete. Um, thanks for the question, Ken. So this question was for Jenny. Uh, they want to know about um, about different marketing techniques, which this was prior to Ivory's presentation, but basically asking about different marketing techniques versus being uh, small versus larger businesses. And so um, if you wanted to talk, I guess maybe you could use your example by how you guys grew, because you started with one smaller greenhouse and then you've gone to two and to three. And what's that look like? Uh, what's diversification look like on your farm? You know, selling to one place versus diversifying who you're selling to. And uh, I guess we'll just kind of spin it that way. Well, I mean, marketing techniques, I mean, it really, it was just, you know, when you're a small farm, it's not like you're gonna be able to pay for say print advertising or television or, or radio spots. I mean, it's, so you have to use what you can um, and make it effective. So, you know, having your signage, having, you know, wearing, you know, shirts that have your farm name on them because people will see that um, and just talking your story to people that you meet. And um, those were like probably for a small farm like ours, 
those were really good things. How investing in those business cards, and believe it or not, those brochures that I have. I mean, people will pick those up either at the farm had picked them up at the farmers markets, or you know, here at the farm when they visit, and they will keep them. I mean, we just recently had somebody contact our farm um, that had kept that brochure for four years, and they're like yeah, I've been wanting to do this. And I just thought, okay, now's the time to start talking to you guys about it. So, um, you know, those things are really, you know, get networking with people. Um, the all, I think really in the word of mouth, getting people to, getting somebody excited about your, your farm, your product, and then get, letting them go out and tell the story for you. So that's, and that's how we started with, yeah, as Matt said, we started very small and because we were doing those farmer's markets and my, Doug and I were both working full-time jobs, doing the farm, raising the fish and the produce. And at, during the summer, we did five farmer's markets, not Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So we were very busy, but it really got people talking. A lot of people in different areas got to see us. So um, talking with just, um, for example, a um, one of the farmer's markets we did was for one of the bigger companies here um, close to us. It's a big manufacturing. And their logistics company had a um, decided to have an employee farmer's market so that the employees can come out on their lunch break and shop at the farmer's market. That one little thing led to the bigger factory representative in their wellness department contacting us and saying, hey, you know, we're gonna do this too, but we're gonna offer our employees incentives to buy your product because it's healthy. You know, and chefs telling other chefs word of mouth. So that, you know, created a, a, a real big demand for our our produce into which we then expanded into building a second and third greenhouse and systems to grow more. Awesome, Jenny. Thanks so much for that. Appreciate it. Uh, looks like we did have a, a couple others did slide up uh, here. Um, there's not much of that that goes on here uh, in the United, well, there's some that goes on in the United States, but not much goes on in the Midwest. But I have a question here is, how can we identify markets or channels for exporting our products? And for sake of this conversation, I'm going to assume they're talking about exporting outside of the United States. Um, it may be a more pertinent question to ask about demand right here in our state and in our region, as opposed to exporting the products. But does anyone want to talk about exportation? If not, I can chime in. I think it depends on what product we are talking about. Uh, because we, we import over 90% of our seafood here in the US. So anything that we export should be very unique, very different uh, from you know, whatever is available over there, wherever we are exporting to. So that's very important. Uh, I don't know the product this uh, quest, uh, this uh, person who has the question is talking about, but I'll, I'll say that you have to be mindful of what product you are talking about, whether it's really worth it doing it, because other than that, it will not be worth, you know, thinking about export at this time. That's very true. We raise over 30 species here in the state and over 50 in the region and a couple hundred throughout the country. So we've got a lot going on. Ivory, you did mention something about speed dating. You want to say uh, say something about that? So I linked to an article um, there, and the link is below um, a USDA article called Seafood Speed Dating Connects U.S. Suppliers and Foreign Buyers. So the exports that we do do typically go to the east, which doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. I would just echo what, what Matt said about the opportunity here at home. Um, typically, folks will work through a distributor through a large system to be able to do those exports. Um, know that that is not um, going to, not a lot of the dollars going to stay home 
right? When you use a large export system. So unless you are producing at a ginormous scale, that's, that's a hard business model. Doesn't mean it can't happen. Um, but looking at our local demand and how that continues to increase every year, we saw data in the last presentation on that. Um, I would just recommend looking at some local marketing channels, um, even if you are producing at a very large scale. Yeah, just to kind of um, piggyback onto that with the export, um, you know, yes, a lot of dollars will not stay at home. That's, I will say, depending on how big you are, I mean, if you don't have enough, enough product to do that, it's definitely not going to be worth it. Same thing exists though, even for home, like if you decide that you want to work with a wholesaler, such as, you know, like if I, we were approached by one of the produce wholesalers, um, you see their trucks everywhere because they do get into a lot of restaurants and they're like, we can help you do this. Well, that's great, but they only, you have to deal with them. You not only have to agree upon a price to sell it to you, but then you have extra costs in making sure you package label and um, you know prepare and have ready for pickup and delivery to their site those expenses so you know if you're selling say you know your fillets of fish for $19 a pound you know at the farmers market directly to your consumer and you agree upon that to like a wholesaler then they're going to say, okay, but we want it vacuum sealed. We want it labeled. We want it put in these types of boxes on dry ice, blah, 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 you know, all those other things. That's all going to take away from that cost where maybe your cost to sell that at the farmer's market was only, and I'm just giving hypothetical numbers here, say $5. So you're still profiting 14 or whatever. Now your cost may be, you know, 12. So you're only pocketing seven. So you have to, you have to think about those things. The other thing I would chime in is if you're going to be losing some of the dollar to move up into the next uh, complex, complex level of market, really think about, Hmm, you know, and you're doing it because you're producing at a volume, right? And you're like, I need to move more. I've got to move markets. Well, do you, or do you, can you hire someone part-time? Would you be better capturing that dollar by hiring someone part time and getting that higher dollar doing more direct sales? So, uh, you know, back to our point about knowing your your cost to produce the item and knowing what you can uh, get for your fish or for your produce. Think about if well, if I'm going to be you know moving into an intermediate market and I'm going to be retaining less profit. Is that better for me to hire a part time sales manager or something like that? and losing the dollar that way and capturing more of the profit for myself. You are the only one who's going to know this because you're the only one who knows your numbers. But um, just some considerations. It can work and be profitable in a lot of different ways. I would just like to add to that a lot of times when we have farms that are producing on a small scale going for that direct market, they're actually getting higher value than if they go into the wholesale market. So for example, a shrimp farm that's selling off the farm, they'll go for sell their shrimp for 18 to sometimes $22 a pound. But if they go into the wholesale market, those wholesalers are asking for products that are 10 to $12 a pound. So if you have the volume and you're making money on volume, that might be a good strategic move, but you actually might lose money and it might cost you more money for the additional um, type of packaging that you might need. And the other thing that I wanted to add is we do have growers that are that are selling outside of the United States. That's typically to Canada and that's typically into live markets. So they're working with brokers or fish haulers to sell large volumes of fish that would fill like a semi um, a semi full of fish into one market. So we do have some people that are exporting into Canada. That's a good uh, point, Amy, even though I've been in uh, Ohio for five years now, I still think about being in Arkansas and sending ornamentals to Europe, you know, overnight, and those types, well, not overnight, but uh, shipping ornamentals and things like that across, uh, across the seas. Um, all right, let's see on the next question. 
So this question, it's kind of long, but it's directed towards Ivory, I guess. They're asking about small businesses, and I'll, I'll chime in here as well. Can a small business, for example, locally grown tilapia, tapping into the consumers of frozen products that are buying the imported products? So I think it's pretty much just convincing those buyers, and it's not even necessarily convincing some of those buyers. It's going after different buyers who are wanting a higher quality product as opposed to the cheapest thing they can find at the grocery store. But I, I guess maybe just a two cents on um, your thoughts regarding what those different customers look like. Someone who's just going to Kroger as opposed to those people who are going to the farmer's markets and looking for a higher quality product. My two cents on that would be, yes, you can, but a better strategy might be to find your people and sell to them. Um, because when you're converting a customer from one, one kind of segment to another, so for example, you have the person that's going to Kroger that's buying the big bag of imported uh, fish, they have a price point in mind, there needs to be a lot of education. Now, fortunately, we heard from Amy, and it looks like there is a lot of education available now for you guys. I'm kind of excited to go and look at those recipes after this session. Um, but there's a lot of education materials there, so we can educate consumers on the quality, on the aspects of local, on the kinds of product differentiation that you all are doing. We can educate those consumers and get them to be buying more of a local product. But there are plenty of people that are not because like Amy mentioned, they don't know how to produce, they don't know how to cook it. Like they don't know how to prepare the product, but they're more than willing to buy that local product. They're at the income level, maybe near uh, you in a demographic situation where those might be the people that you will have a higher success rate of selling to than converting those folks that are going into Kroger or Walmart to buy an imported uh, lower priced product. So that would be my suggestion to you. If you are still, if that's your goal and you are, you are going to get those people to be buying local products that we all know is much better, I think you do that through education. You do that through on-farm tours, um, by welcoming folks to your farm, by showing them the system, by creating those super fans we talked about and having that spread through word of mouth. And I think that's a worthy endeavor to build your customer base, um, but know who the folks are that are interested in your product now. I think is really the key to growing your customer base. That's a great uh, two cents there, Ivory. I would say that um, uh, in relation to something that always comes to mind when we're talking about competing with those frozen fillets, no matter what the species is, uh, I always come back to one of the uh, producers in the North Central region, uh, up, up kind of uh, a little bit further north, they talk about their product and that they do have someone else that processes their product through part of their mark. That's part of their marketing uh, channel, but they only sell fresh fillets. The moment they freeze their trout, they look identical. Even within the United States, they look identical to Idaho and Idaho is where most of the, uh, most of the rainbow trout are produced. And so obviously you're not going to compete with them on price especially when you freeze, you look identical to that product, but they're not, there's nobody in Idaho really selling fresh fillets. I mean, there's some of it, but not a whole lot. And so they they talk about the moment that I start to freeze my product, I really have a hard time competing, but you know, I'm selling here in Michigan and these are never frozen fillets. They were just swimming two days ago, the day before there, I can command a higher price and I'm looking, you know, I'm pulling in different customers than I normally would if I was just, again, just another frozen product. So uh, that's the type of stuff that always comes to mind. All right, done there. So we have someone that followed up on that exportation um, question, and I have zero experience with these species. So let's talk uh, very briefly about American eels, because that was the species they were talking about exporting, uh, which is still extremely new. I know Michigan just recently approved them. Um, I don't know any other state in the North Central region, um, but it may be something we have to talk about offline here. Uh, anybody look into the Michigan company or have any experience with eels at all? Me neither, just visiting a eel farm in Vietnam a number of years ago, but that, that was about it. So, um, Whoever answered this or asked this question right here, feel free to message me and we can chat offline 
um, no problem. I'll make sure to put my email address down there in the bottom. All right. So I don't see any more right here. Um, but I, I do have a question or two, I guess. So websites in 2021. I guess I'll talk a, a little bit about that. We do find some folks, uh, for example, Ivory, you know Christy Welch very well. They do strawberries, direct marketing. You come and do you pick or they'll bring it to you. They sell all they want um, and they really just have a great Facebook page and they don't even bother with a website in 2021, which they've never had a website, but um, are, are we seeing as many of these places it, it being just as important? Amy, what are you seeing? Are there a lot of websites still or which there probably are, but you know, how much more emphasis is it just to focus on social media? So I, I think that there's a combination of both. So your website is gonna be different from your um, Facebook in the way that that is kind of like was mentioned, it is your yellow pages, right? It's your landing place. And people are actually, many people are using them to complement each other. So they'll put the meat on their website that's always there and they can add to it. And then they use that social media to drive customers to their website. And especially if you have like an online store and you're looking into e-commerce, that's very popular. I think we're starting to see a trend of people moving away from Facebook and starting to utilize Instagram more. So Facebook has started to become very restrictive when it comes to their algorithms. And they're really promoting you having to boost your business by paying for advertising dollars to get wider reach. So it might go that way, but it also kind of doesn't constrain you into that, um, the algorithms that are preventing people from seeing your material. So I think that we see that it is farm specific. So some farms will choose to use Facebook instead of a website. Some will use both um, to drive that activity. So I think it's whatever fits best for your for your farm and your time. So social media sometimes takes more time and effort than just having a, a website. I agree. I agree with that. Um, Facebook for businesses, well, for a lot of posts, if you, they want you to be able to get to engage with, with your consumer. So if you're not getting likes in shares and I mean it's all it's all tied into that you have you have to have that engagement so that people are constantly liking people are constantly sharing to keep your post more visible if not then they they kind of go back in, into the background and are are kind of buried in news feeds so websites again they are kind of like a landing page I mean so when somebody searches Fresh Harvest Farm, they're going to at least see a web page that somebody can go to, and they're not going to have to worry about trying to find the Facebook or, you know, it'll take you to the Facebook page a lot of times too, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, I know for us, I have just, you know, I have recently been through um, with our, our I'm moving away from the traditional websites of having you create a website with them. So like I have to now find a new website provider and build a new website. But I, I'm really looking into it as far as like, I don't want to pay, I don't want it to be a huge expense because I'm not selling, you know, doing e-commerce or anything. I'm just providing information for consumers who are looking for us. Um, but I was thinking as Amy was giving her presentation and the, the website that they're creating to help people find, you know, if you are involved in that and you have a page there, you can probably with your Facebook, you know, or, you know, point people to that page. And not only will they find you, but you've also now helped them find others. So I, you know, that's kind of a, a good idea. There are many farm, fish farms, um, in dealing with the fish farmers in OAA, 
Um, I have learned that a lot of them don't have websites and, you know, it, it is time consuming and they don't want to, you know, have the expenditure of it. I get that. So something like what they're, they're putting together would, would be good for those types of farmers. Um, but I, I think that it's still, you know, Facebook, Instagram, a website, um, and now um, are, are all going to go hand in hand. And one of the other things that, you know, you could do if you're part of OAA, we now have a member community on Discord, which we have different channels and one of them is buying and selling. And, you know, so within our, our organization as members, you know, just recently in the past few days, people have been, you know, saying, hey, I need this and, oh, I have that. And it's creating that, that network that people can find and creating sales for some people. So, um, and Matt's put it up on his background there. Um, you know, so that's kind of one of the new things coming up that, you know, that we're, that as, as OAA, we're exploring and that we're really finding that, you know, there's been a lot of discussion on there recently. That's kind of nice. So just my two cents. And I also just wanted to add really quick is that we have seen an evolution of um, technology when it comes to websites where people can use kind of a build your own service for a relatively low cost and even ones that incorporate e-commerce if that's interesting. So like Squarespace and they're modular and you can just plug your pictures and your text in and they're very easy. Um, so that might actually we might see some more trends because you don't have to pay thousands of dollars to have them custom built and then maintained over time. Good point, Amy. Uh, yeah, I, luckily I took a screenshot the other day. So I had this sitting on my desk but, or on my computer's desk. Um, but yeah, this is kind of a view of the of what the Discord looks like. So they've now created a members only portal. And so if you're a member of OAA, get my my background situated over here, but there's a section over here called buying and selling aquatic animals and plants. And so if you're a member of OAA, you know, they let you go on there, but it's a, you can use the app on your phone or you can go straight onto the website, but we have all these different channels. Whereas if you want to ask questions about nutrition, feeds and feeding, if you want to ask about water quality, if you want to ask this morning, someone asked, have you already, have you seen um, yellow perch egg ribbons yet? So that's a great way for the pond folks to say, are you starting to see the females laying their eggs yet? Have you seen them in your area? So it's just a way to increase communication, but there is a marketing section within there, which is really interesting. Um, so you obviously don't need to be located in Ohio to be a member, but uh, it's a pretty good little educational tool there. So uh, good good mentioning, Jenny. Um, the, other, the other thing that I noticed with the Discord, um, which would be, I think, very helpful to farmers, um, in the last few days, we've seen a lot of inquiries into um, different types of species of being available. It's kind of showing a trend of demand of a, you know certain species that are that are out there. So I think that's again very heart, helpful to farmers um, in planning, you know, either for this season or next season. So I. I think that's all on the questions, but I've got one more and I don't want it to take too long because I know we're a hair over 12 minutes, but uh, I guess it would have been good to have somebody from the Ohio Restaurant Association involved in something like this uh, webinar, but I'm still always interested in how welcoming restaurants really are for whoever wants to answer the question in times where it does need to be more of a chalkboard special because you know I am such a small farm that I can't have product available every single week or or, or whatever it may be, I guess I'm still kind of interested in how welcoming, and obviously outside of COVID, COVID's thrown a wrench in everything. Uh, we all know that and we can have all, and we have had webinars just on that. But what do you guys see as far as, you know, maybe I only have it available once a month and it only lasts for a week. So I can chime in on this. If you find the right restaurant, they are more than happy to do a single kind of special thing when you have a product. Um, when I say right restaurant, I mean those downtown, uh, local food focused, um, where it can more than just, we have this special fish uh, 
fit dinner for you. They're actually wanting to make the connection that this fish came from Fresh Harvest Farms. Um, I mentioned the example of Jenny actually being there. So I'm talking about those restaurants downtown that are more like special occasion things. Uh, we had in Ross County, for an example, uh, local farms often will do that with beef and poultry, where it's a special over a weekend, a special event, and then they'll promote it. Like this is coming from a farm here in your county and people come really, even if they're not, you know, regu regularly frequenting that restaurant to try local food. So you can find those places. It might just be a special and not a permanent spot on the menu. And it might be promoted as such. But what a fantastic way to get your foot in the door with a restaurant and also have a track record of working with restaurants if you are. Thanks, I, Ivory. I, I, because you've got, of course, you're involved with Ross County, I have to always think of, of Way Farms, but on the restaurant side, I have to think of... Um, of our kitchen on paint because that's my wife's favorite restaurant. Uh, she just loves it and they do a, a really great job with that sort of stuff. That's a great example of a restaurant that does just that. So they'll run a special with a local producer and, um, or like Jenny mentioned, you know, the kind of restaurant where you can take fish on ice, they know how to process it. You would be amazed how many people don't even know how to cut up that fish. So you're gonna have the kind, it's the kind of caliber of cuisine where they're going to want that kind of product and they're going to want to work with you to promote it. So I, I say the key would be to look and find the right restaurant. I agree. It's going to be that that local locally owned niche restaurant that has started using local products and they are very welcoming, very welcoming to farmers and they're very willing to work with farmers. Um, the rest, you know, Harvest Pizzeria, I mean, in my slide, in my presentation, the one that had the Harvest logo on it, if you notice down there, it said our farmers and it had listed us and where we are located. You know, they are very willing to promote your farm and tell people where it comes from um, and to work with you on your availability of product. So, you know, the one, the one that is really interested in, in getting the perch when, you know, they can come back with their special, he's like saying it's not even going to be a week long special, it'll be a weekend special. So he will, know, you know, he'll be able to say I want X number of pounds, and I'll probably be able to supply it. It's not something, you know, we have another restaurant that wants to use it on a weekly fish fry. And it's, it's hard to tell, you know, he knows what his poundage that he goes through currently on the fish that he's using, but will it be the same with the perch or will it be more, you know? And that's one that I'm like, I, you know, I have to work with him. It's like, maybe you can do it as a special every once in a while, not every week. So, um, but yeah, they're willing to work. Thanks, Jenny, appreciate that. Um, all right, we're at 1210. We have gone over just a few minutes. I do really want to thank Mama and Ivory, Jenny and Amy uh, for presenting today. I think it went over really well uh, for everyone, all of the attendees here. This presentation is being recorded. Uh, these are massive webinars, so it takes me a while to get it lo uh, lo loaded up onto YouTube, uh, but make sure to check out and uh, go to YouTube. The Ohio Aquaculture Association now has a um, uh, a YouTube site, so you can go there and see the previous month's presentations. Um, I don't, I'm, I don't have it in front of me, Noel. Uh, it's just Ohio Aquaculture Association. Uh, if you type that into YouTube, it'll be the very top link there. Um, make sure you go and check out uh, last month's, which was the recirculating aquaculture systems, and then the month before that was a special on the tadpole productions. Next month, we're gonna talk about uh, fish health and we're gonna have a few veterinarians uh, from both here in Ohio as well as down in Mississippi uh, chat with us about how we can uh, make sure we're taking care of our aquatic animals. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, joining and attending and uh, uh, thank you all for uh, reaching out to us. The OAA does draw the names. If you're an OAA member, they do draw a name out of a hat basically to make sure that um, you can win a uh, performance t-shirt that they've got uh, for joining with us today.
We're going to go ahead and sign off. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining with us. Bye.